Picking up where we left off last time, we will continue to dive deep into Psalm 119 in this video. I won't waste any time on a lengthy intro. Let's just jump right into this one. As a refresher, Psalm 119 is located in the center of the scriptures, and its sole theme is God's Word. The psalm is organized into 22 sets of 8 verses, and each verse in a set begins with the same Hebrew character. Each verse, with the exception of verse 122, uses at least one term for God's law. The 10 Hebrew words used for God's Word in Psalm 119 are Torah, Eduth, Mishpat, Kok, Daba, Pikud, Mitzvah, Derek, Imra, and Ameth. We covered the first five words in the last video. Torah is translated into the English word law. Eduth is translated into the English word testimonies. Mishpat translates to judgments. Kok is translated into English as statutes. And Daba is translated into the English word word. That catches anyone up that may have missed the previous video. The sixth word in Psalm 119 referring to God's word is pikud, and translates to the English word precepts in Psalm 119, 87. They almost destroyed me on earth, but as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. Wouldn't we all like to make that statement as we cross into God's kingdom, that we made it by the skin of our teeth and did not forsake God's word? The psalmist definitely experienced protection when he kept God's precepts. Even when threatened with death, true faith requires that we keep God's precepts. Pikud comes from the root pakad, which refers to responsibility, specifically to attend to or to provide for, and when used as a noun references a responsibility assigned to one trusted to accomplish it. God takes responsibility for those who hold to his word. As a shepherd keeps his flock, so Jesus keeps us. John 10, 3. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. In fact, Jesus gave his life for his sheep. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And verse 15, Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. We must do the same thing in keeping God's word and the duties that he has entrusted with us. 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, and I have kept the faith. Mitzvah is translated into the English word commandments in Psalm 119, 176. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. I think all of us feel this way now and again, that we've strayed from where God wants us to be. As a good shepherd, he's always faithful to find us and bring us back into the fold. We must be careful to always remember God's word. Jesus is our example in this, John 15:10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Keeping these commandments leads to life. In fact, Christ states that God's commandment is life in John 12:50. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Eternal life, then, is granted to those that obey these commandments. As stated before, Jesus kept God's commands and obeyed fully, so we must obey Jesus' commands. The water only became wine when the servants at the wedding feast obeyed Jesus. Let's read the account, John 2, verses 5 through 9. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing twenty or thirty gallons each. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Derek is translated into way in Psalm 119.37. 
Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity, and revive me in your ways. The word revive here is kaya, and literally means to live. God's word brings life. Our eyes must not focus on vain, fleeting things, but only on God's word. When our eyes are firm fixed on God's way, we will receive this life. Jesus claimed to be this way in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In fact, the early church were not called Christians. It wasn't until the church in Antioch was founded in Acts chapter 11 that the church began to be called Christians. Prior to this, followers of Christ were referred to as followers of the way. Acts 9, 1 through 2. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Jesus describes himself as the way to eternal life. Matthew 1, 13-14 Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now wait a minute, Deacon. That doesn't say anything about Jesus being the gate or the way. You're right. Let's hear it from Jesus himself. Let's read John chapter 10, verses 9 and 27 through 28. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and will go in and out and find pasture. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, that they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If we are to follow our shepherd in this way, Christ says we have to pick up our own cross. Matthew 16:24. Then Jesus said to his disciple, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. Although the way can sometimes look like the way of death, many men and women have given their lives in pursuit of the way. Pick up Fox's Book of Martyrs for some examples. It is truly the way that leads to life. Imra is translated into the English word promise in Psalm 119, 147 through 148. I rise before the dawn and cry for help. I have put my hope in your word. My eyes stay open through the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promises. The Hebrew word used for word in verse 147 is a word we've already discussed, Daba, and references God's speech, or literally his words. In verse 148, the psalmist clarifies that the specific speech, or words that he stays awake for through the watches of the night, are God's promises, so that he can meditate on them. The psalmist claims to stay awake all night unaware of the time, so that he can meditate on God's imra, or promises. The verb form of the noun imra is amar, and means to utter, to say, and is used throughout the Genesis 1 creation account when God speaks creation into existence. Let's read Hebrews 11.3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. The Bible is also clear that this creation was accomplished through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Jesus Christ is the Lord of creation. When God speaks by Christ, the answer is yes and amen. Let's read 2 Corinthians 1, 19-20. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen, to the glory of God through us. Jesus spoke this word of promise 322 times in the New Testament, stating, Truly, truly I say to you, He was stating truth that would definitely come to pass, a faithful promise given by God. And that leads us to our final word used in Psalm 119 for God's words. Emeth is translated into the English word truth 
in Psalm 119, 43. And do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I wait for your ordinances. For the first time here, we're looking at an adjective describing God's word. The Hebrew word for word here is again debah, referring to God's speech. But the word emeth is added describing God's speech as truth. This word is also used as a noun to refer to God's truth. Let's read Genesis 24, verse 27. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. The word truth here is a meth, referring to words spoken to Abraham by God. God's faithfulness is the motive force that fulfills all the covenants in redemptive history. Jesus, as the principal character within redemptive history, is described as truth in a verse we've already looked at, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The word truth here is the Greek word aletheia and does not merely mean truth as spoken, but truth of idea, reality, and sincerity. Truth in the moral sphere and divine truth revealed to man. In Greek culture at the time, aletheia was synonymous with reality, as in the opposite of illusion, or in other words, fact. This word, emeth, also has another Greek counterpart in the New Testament, amen, literally meaning true or truly. God describes himself as the amen, the faithful and true witness in Revelation 3-4. Thank you for joining me in this series. We're beginning now a series on the Ten Commandments, the essence of all of God's laws. They were given to all of humanity as God's eternal word. The Ten Commandments are God's laws, testimonies, judgments, statues, his word, precepts, his commandments, his ways, his promises, and his truths. The ten attributes we've discussed for the word in Psalm 119 enable us to keep the ten commandments out of grace. We must ourselves be filled with these ten attributes. We must consult the word to ensure we are following God's law before making any decision. The law helps us to recognize sin so that we can repent, and this causes God to come near to us and give us grace. We must allow the Word to show us the evidence of Christ so that our faith can grow. The Holy Spirit itself testifies to the truth of this testimony. We must follow God's judgments because they lead to life. This is because His judgments are characterized by love. We must allow the Word to become a boundary for us. Through the wisdom we gain by declaring God's statutes, we may live. We must allow God's word to strengthen us. It is God's word that enable us to stand in the midst of grief. We must use the word and allow it to show us the precepts of God that we can fulfill our God-given responsibilities in the body of Christ as he himself gave his own life to fulfill his responsibility. We must carefully examine the word to ensure we are obedient. Jesus himself is our example of this. We must use the word to direct our way. Jesus himself is our way and the enabler for us to enter God's way. We must meditate on God's promises because they are promises of hope. And we must allow the word to reveal the truth to us by dispelling all falsehood. We can trust in Jesus because he is completely trustworthy. Thank you for watching, everyone. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. God bless.